Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Good morning everybody. Today we will be talking about fabricating scaffolds for tissue engineering applications. We have looked at some of the materials which can be used. We have looked at the natural polymers and synthetic polymers. So, we will also be talking about other materials. However, today we are going to talk about how scaffolds can be fabricated. So, as you all know in the from the previous lectures, we want to prepare a scaffold which can actually mimic the extracellular matrix. So, the extracellular matrix supports cells to adhere, grow and it also provides uh, cues and signals which help in the cells to perform the way they do. So, this helps in making sure that the cells integrate to form a tissue. So, when we are engineering this tissue, it is crucial that we prepare a scaffold which can mimic the functionalities of the extracellular matrix. So, let us try and recollect what are all the properties that we look for? First thing is it needs to be biocompatible. So, that is decided based on the material you choose. So, that would not be a part of the fabrication strategy itself. If you are looking at what parameters have to be brought into fabrication, then we have to see what else are there. One of the things which is crucial is the surface area to volume ratio. If you have a high surface area to volume ratio, you can load more cells which means there will be higher cell density and there is a higher chance of the tissue functioning as it should. So, creating tissues which have this kind of a high surface area to volume ratio would be very effective. Another factor is pore interconnectivity. So, when you create pores in a scaffold, you need to have them connected to each other. Why is this crucial? When you have good pore interconnectivity, you will have better cell infiltration, which means the cells can actually go inside the pores and populate the tissue to form a living tissue. So, creating an interconnected pore would be advantageous. This can also help in formation of blood vessels. So, this way you would have sustained nutrient supply and toxin removal. So, this is an important factor which needs to be considered as well. Other than this, you also need to make sure that the material is fabricated into uh, the shape and uh, properties which fit the tissue which you are looking for. So, taking all these into consideration, you have to design strategies which can help in fabricating scaffolds. So, today we will talk about some of the more commonly used strategies for fabricating tissue engineering scaffolds. These are some of the strategies which we will be talking about today. The first one is called as a leaching method. So, this is a broad category within which there are multiple strategies which can be used for fabricating scaffolds. So, the three strategies which are commonly employed are solvent casting and salt leaching or ice particle leaching, gas foaming and salt leaching. So, what is done here is a scaffold is prepared and gas forming salt which is leached out to create porous uh, structure. So, we will see how it is done and how the scaffold would look like if this strategy is used. So, the next type of uh, scaffold fabrication strategy is using microspheres. So, you can create microspheres using different strategies. It could be just a simple uh, thing like preparing alginate beads. So, which you might have done as part of uh, one of your undergraduate uh, lab programs. Uh, or you can create macroporous beads using different strategies and you can also have these beads aggregate to form a scaffold creating a porous structure. So, these are different strategies which have been employed to create a scaffold using microspheres of different polymers. It could either be synthetic or natural. The next strategy is called as a phase separation strategy. So, here uh, you have two techniques, one is the freeze drying method and there is also a thermally induced phase separation method. 
So, by creating a phase separation you can actually uh, create porous structures and this also will provide a good interconnected pores. So, we will see uh, more about freeze drying method and see how exactly the scaffolds would look like and what is the principle behind the freeze drying method. So, you also have fiber spinning uh, strategies. So, this is where you have different uh, textile based uh, fabrication methods which are employed in tissue engineering. So, nano fiber electro spinning, uh, microfiber wet spinning and non oven uh, polymer fibers are all some of the uh, commonly, prepa uh, commonly used methods for preparing fibrous scaffolds. In many of the extracellular matrix you have a fibrous structure. So, creating a fibrous structure using these kinds of uh, spinning techniques can actually mimic ECM very effectively. In case of electro spinning where you create nano fibers, you would also have a significantly large surface area to volume ratio which can help in cell adhesion and proliferation. So, we will talk about electro spinning strategy and uh, look at how those scaffolds will look like as well. So, next strategy is called as decellularized matrix. So, this is one of the uh, common uh, one of the growing strategies which is being looked at. So, where you actually take the extracellular matrix from the native tissue. This could be either from a human donor or also from uh, non-human sources from other species. So, what you do here is you remove the cells and all the cell based components. So, this is done through different uh, methods it could be uh, using some chemical treatment or physical treatment followed by uh, complete removal of all the toxins. So, this way you create a matrix which resembles the native tissue. Uh, so, here the major challenge is actually to remove the cells and its components uh, without damaging the integrity of the extracellular matrix. So, if you can do that uh, maintain the mechanical properties physical, chemical and biological properties then you would have an extracellular matrix which probably has all the desired functionality and thereby it will be able to provide all the biological cues as well. So, this would be an ideal strategy to look at however, it is a major challenge to make sure that the properties of the scaffold is not lost during the decellularization process. So, we will not be talking about this today but uh, you can read about this on uh, many of the papers which are uh, readily available. So, the last and the up and coming strategy which is which people are looking at is 3D printing. So, 3D printing is a novel technology where people are looking at how uh, scaffolds can be prepared by bioprinting the uh, scaffolds. So, here an ink is used. So, the ink will basically contain the material which you want the scaffold to be formed with and this can be used for fabricating scaffolds based on the design we need using AutoCAD and other uh, CAD based software. So, here uh, you can also load cells along with them and print the 3D print 3D structure for the tissues. So, we will be talking about this in a future lecture. So, there is also another strategy which is called a self assembly. So, that will also be discussed in detail in a later lecture. So, now let us look at some of the more traditional strategies which are the leaching methods where we will be talking about the solvent casting and salt leaching and also the gas forming and salt leaching method. So, we will first start discussing this. Let us first talk about solvent casting and salt leaching method. So, this is an example of how you would use this method to prepare a scaffold. So, in the protocol given you have three things first is a solvent which can dissolve the polymer and the salt which you are trying to use for this method. So, the polymer chosen here is PLGA and the salt which is used is just NaCl or sodium chloride. So, these three are poured into one uh, vessel and they are mixed to create a homogeneous mixture. This homogeneous mixture is then poured into a silicon mold where you keep it and evaporate the solvent. So, once the solvent is evaporated you now have a solid structure. So, which will have the uh, shape as the silicon mold. So, here they have shown a disc like uh, mold. So, you would end up with disc like scaffolds. 
So, now this scaffold which you have contains the polymer and the salt. The salt because it was a homogeneous mixture uh, while it was in solution, the salt crystals would have formed in different parts of the uh, polymer um, scaffold. So, now the next step is to leach this salt. So, this is done using di water. So, you place the uh, salt polymer scaffold into the di water and mix it for 48 hours. By doing this, the salt will actually get dissolved out and you will end up with a disc shaped scaffold which is only the polymer. So, now this can be uh, kept in a vacuum oven after uh, freeze drying to remove all the uh, leftover water. So, thereby you now have a scaffold which is prepared through solvent casting and salt leaching. So, how does this create a porous matrix? So, the salt which was present would have crystallized and formed uh, salt crystals in the polymer mixture in the polymer blend. So, this salt when it dissolves out or gets leached, leached out the area occupied the volume occupied by these uh, salt crystals will now become pores. So, these porous structures are used for uh, cell uh, attachment and culture. So, these kinds of cells uh, scaffolds would look like this under a scanning electron microscope. So, what you see here are uh, images of salt leached uh, scaffolds. So, you can see nice structures which are uh, basically the regions where the salt crystals were occupying. So, when you look at the same images you would also see that there are some uh, areas which are dark black while some are grey indicating that there is a 3D structure and there are uh, crystals which have been formed all over creating such pores. However, one of the limitations you would see is in many of these uh, pores there is very poor interconnectivity. For example, you look at this particular pore. So, this pore actually uh, is fully covered you actually have a region where cells can go and attach, but they cannot penetrate into the scaffold if they go into this pore. So, this would mean the interconnectivity might not be excellent when you are talking about uh, solvent casting and salt leaching method. To overcome this limitation uh, people have looked at gas forming and salt leaching method. So, this also uses very similar principle. However, instead of using uh, a simple NaCl kind of salt, you use a salt which can uh, which can cause gas to be uh, generated. So, here what they have looked at is uh, here is an example. So, where they have prepared a polymer gel uh, using a non-solvent precipitation method and uh, the polymer gel paste along with the ammonium bicarbonate salt particles is mixed and you pour it into a Teflon mold to create a semi solidified polymer salt complex. So, this semi solidified polymer salt complex is then added to the uh, acidic aqueous solution or to hot water. So, what happens when you do this is the ammonia and carbon dioxide gets uh, generated and starts uh, effervescing re getting released into the water. So, from the, uh, the salt polymer blend you now have the gas leaving and so this leaves a porous scaffold. So, you end up with a macroporous scaffold which can then be freeze dried to actually uh, be stored for, uh, for further use. So, the scaffold which you have uh, prepared using gas forming and salt leaching method would look something like this. So, what you see here are pores which have good interconnectivity. So, because the gas is actually pumped through the pores you would have nice interconnectivity for the pores. So, you can see that there are lots of pores uh, you look at the same image. So, you see that there is a pore and these are some, some of the pores and as you see most of these pores are very deep and even in uh, this particular pore you would see there are smaller pores which are much darker in color indicating that they are uh, much deeper and they are actually probably interconnected to some other pore. So, this kind of a highly interconnected pore can actually be very useful when you are talking about uh, tissue engineering applications. So, as I had already mentioned cells will be able to infiltrate you would also be able to get blood vessels uh, forming and also it can help in uh, good diffusion 
in early stages of uh, any tissue being implanted nutrient supply has to come through diffusion. So, if you have such highly interconnected porous structures, so the diffusion will be uh, effective thereby it would not be a limiting factor when you are talking about tissue formation. Let us move on to the next strategy. So, one of the strategies which I mentioned is formation of microspheres. So, here we will be talking about one of the uh, uh, 3 or 4 different strategies which have been used where microspheres have been used to prepare scaffolds. So, what is done first is the polymer is dissolved in a solvent and then uh, you start dropping it into uh, a solution. First this polymer is dissolved and then it is actually dropped through a small uh, pore using a maybe a syringe pump or something and then it is being mixed, uh, it is stirred and then it is centrifuged to remove these beads, uh, these microsp uh, microspheres which are washed and then uh, freeze dried. So, these freeze dried uh, microspheres can form structures like this. So, as you see these are nice spheres which are present and you see the cells which have adhered on this as well. So, these images which you see on the scaffold are actually cells which have been uh, adhered to the scaffolds. So, because you have these microspheres which have assembled to form the scaffold, you also have uh, a porous st structure which is present in between these spheres. So, this can help in uh, infiltration of nutrients and also hopefully cell infiltration. Okay. So, this is what is done for preparing microspheres. Moving on to the next topic, you have freeze drying. So, freeze drying is one of the most commonly used methods for creating uh, a scaffold which is highly porous. So, what you do here is uh, you basically create the uh, polymer so, uh, solution and you pour it in a mold and this uh, mold, uh, this polymer blend is actually then frozen and kept for freeze drying. So, freeze drying is also called as lyophilization and in, uh, after freeze drying it is washed and dried, you can also re lyophilize it to make sure that uh, you have a completely functional scaffold. So, when you observe these scaffolds under a scanning electron microscope, you would it would look something like this. So, these are actually scaffolds which were prepared in my lab where uh, Isab Gol, one of the carbohydrate polymers was actually uh, lyophilized to form scaffolds. As you can see, it is a highly porous structure and you have uh, huge pores which are very nicely interconnected as well. So, this kind of a highly interconnected structure which you can see in the magnified uh, images which are highly in, uh, porous, this kind of structure can help in um, cell infiltration and also with nutrient diffusion. So, this is one of the common strategies which is used. We will look at the principle which causes this kind of a porous structure. So, in the earlier cases where we looked at salt leaching or gas forming, it was quite simple. We had the salt crystals which were present which got washed away creating the pore. You had the uh, gas forming uh, salt which then released the gas which could be ammonia and carbon dioxide in the example we showed. So, this caused the pores. However, here where are the pores coming from? We only did lyophilization. For that reason, you need to understand what the process of lyophilization does. So, let us look at the phase diagram for water. So, this is a simple phase diagram where it is between uh, the plot between pressure versus temperature for water. So, you have 3 phases, you have the solid phase, you have the liquid phase and you have the gas phase. So, these 3 phases are existing in the given temperature and pressure conditions. This point is the triple point. So, the triple point is where uh, you would have all three uh, phases existing in equilibrium. So, you also have these curves which are the vapor liquid equilibrium. So, this would be the um, gas liquid equilibrium curve and you would have the solid liquid equilibrium curve here and the gas solid equilibrium curve here. So, these are the uh, curves which you have in this uh, phase diagram. So, now when we are talking about uh, lyophilization, what do we exactly do? See, when we prepare the polymer blend and we actually pour it into a uh, mold, so you have liquid water. 
So, this liquid water if it is evaporated would be the process where you have liquid under some condition moving to gas. So, this is the process of evaporation. However, when you are talking about freeze drying what you are actually doing is not evaporation. You are removing the uh, water at very low pressures. So, what you do is you freeze the water to form ice crystals and these ice crystals are directly so, these ice crystals are directly sublimated instead of being evaporated. So, it is not first it, it does not actually melt to form water and then get evaporated. Instead, these ice crystals directly sublimate to form water vapor. So, how is this accomplished? This is done because at very low pressures in this region where you see the gas solid equilibrium curve here, if you actually have the conditions where solid can move to gas under this condition under these pressures then you would end up with then you would end up with sublimation instead of evaporation. So, what is done is you actually cool the water so that it solidifies and then you reduce the pressure to such a large extent that this solid ice crystal then becomes a gas. So, by creating a vacuum and reducing the pressure significantly you can actually convert solid ice crystals into gas. So, this way you are actually be a, a creating what you would see with salt leaching or gas forming uh, techniques. So, what you have done here is you have created ice crystals within the polymer blend and this ice crystal is then evap is then sublimated. So, causing something like a gas, gas forming effect. So, this results in formation of the highly porous structures. So, this is one of the most commonly used methods for forming scaffolds. So, let us move on to the next topic which is electrospinning. As I already mentioned some of the extracellular matrix is fibrous in nature. So, it is important to create a structure which mimics the natural ECM. So, for this uh, reason people have looked at some of the textile based techniques such as electrospinning for creating scaffolds. Electrospinning creates nanofibrous scaffolds which have been studied extensively for a variety of different applications. So, let us look at electrospinning here. So, what is electrospinning? Electrospinning is a technique where you apply a high voltage to create uh, very thin fibers from a polymer solution. So, what you do is you create a polymer solution which is loaded to a syringe and this syringe is pumped using a syringe pump. So, that the uh, polymer solution comes out of a needle this polymer solution which comes out of the needle is exposed to a high voltage and because of this high voltage it would actually form very very thin fibers. These thin fibers are collected on uh, a collector which could either be a flat surface or it could be a rolling drum and so on. So, here the parameters which can be va varied are the flow rate at which the uh, polymer solution is pumped. You can also vary the viscosity of the polymer solution and you can vary the diameter of the needle. You could vary the uh, voltage which is supplied. There are also parameters such as uh, humidity which can play a role in how these fibers are formed and based on the distance between the collector and the spinneret you would also have uh, the thickness varying. You would another factor which can uh, be looked at is the different types of uh, collectors which are used. By using a flat collector you would be able to get uh, nanofibrous uh, mat which is not aligned. However, if you were to use a rolling drum or something you can actually create aligned fibers. So, the scaffold when you look at uh, under uh, a scanning electron microscope would look something like this. What you see on the left is non aligned electrospun fibers and what you see on the right is the aligned electrospun fibers. So, these are some of the commonly used techniques which are used for scaffold fabrication. So, we have given an overview we have not gone into great detail of each of these techniques depending on the polymer which we have chosen and the application for which we are working on 
we have to choose fabrication strategies which will provide scaffolds which mimic the natural ECM. With this we will move on to some of the more advanced techniques which are being currently researched for scaffold fabrication which would be self assembly and uh, 3D bioprinting. So, self assembly will actually be discussed by Ramya one of my students, she is currently working on her PhD, she will describe uh, how self assembly can be used in tissue engineering. Her research is focused on self assembly, so she would be able to give a very nice perspective, see you all in the next lecture. Thank you.